Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 through 6. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from love of money, and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Amy. Well, as we are coming to the end of Hebrews, we're going to be finishing up Hebrews next week. Uh, But as we've come to the end of Hebrews, there's this kind of feeling uh, that you get as you're uh, going through the last chapter of Hebrews. It's kind of the same feeling you get if you've ever been in a classroom, whether, you know, someone's teaching something on a seminar, been to college, and, you know, the person teaching has like two hours to teach, and they teach for, you know, an hour and 50 minutes, and they realize with 10 minutes to go that they have only covered half of their material, right? And so in that last 10 minutes, they're like, oh, and you need to get this, and, and you need to get this, and you need to get this. So as we open uh, chapter 13, that's, that's exactly what it feels like. All this, I mean, you have all this truth that we've learned. We've learned about Jesus being greater. He's the greater high priest. You know, he's our anchor in heaven. And we've learned all this great stuff. We learned about running the race with endurance and the cloud of witnesses that testifies to that and cheers us on. All this great stuff that we've kind of slowly gone through, these big pictures, and then and the writer of Hebrews is like, oh, yeah, and marriage, and we need to talk about, you know, loving the saints that are, are struggling and showing hospitality. And, uh, you know, last week we had uh, Mark share with us about how to respond to leadership, and there's some other things uh, that we'll talk about next week. And we are going to talk today about money because that's just, he just kind of throws these things out. We could preach it's a separate message on each different verse. That's why it's taken us three messages to get through just six verses, but we need to understand as we come to these verses about money that there is the backdrop of all that we've learned in Hebrews, all that we've learned about Christ. There is a temptation that we could have if we just open up to chapter 13 and just kind of pluck these verses out and have them completely stand on their own, but they don't stand on their own. They have a foundation of this whole book of Hebrews with Jesus being so great and awesome. And in fact, as we come to this passage, oh, even though money is referenced in the first few words of verse 5, we're going to be focused on verses 5 and 6, this morning's message isn't about stewardship. This text isn't primarily about stewardship. It's actually not primarily about money at all. It's about contentment. It's about the heart, and money just kind of is the window into our souls as to how content we are. So we're going to look at three observations about contentment from these verses, but before we do that, let's pray because we need God's help. Father, we need you this morning. We've declared that already in song, but we need you as we come to this passage of Scripture. I ask God that you would help us to see Christ and know how these Verses are informed because of the great work that Christ has done. Lay us open. May we be open to hear what you have to say to us. Maybe it's something we've heard before. Maybe it's something we've never heard before. But I pray, Lord, that we'd hear your voice. and We'd respond to your spirit. And we give glory to your name. We ask all this in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, observation number one is this. Contentment is a heart attitude. Contentment is a heart attitude. Look at verse five. The author of Hebrews says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content. Keep your life free from the love of money. So does that mean we should have money? Should we even have money at all? If I don't have it, I don't have to love it. I don't have to deal with it. Well, no, I mean, there is a necessity for money. Money provides food for us. Money helps provide shelter. If you don't have money, you can't 
do the things of life. Some people would say, well, we shouldn't have any money. And I'm like, well, you got to have some money because like if your car breaks down, if you don't have money, you're going to also lose the car and then you're not going to be able to drive anywhere and you're not going to be able to go to your job. You're not gonna... There's just like this cascading effect if you don't have money or you don't have ways to make transactions. And the Bible would encourage us, well, don't stop working. Don't stop making money because the Bible speaks. We're not going to go to every passage, but it speaks of hard work. It speaks of giving. It speaks of giving and receiving wages. It speaks about investing. It speaks about saving. It speaks about being thrifty. But in today's first world economy, that economy has gone far beyond providing for our needs. The first world philosophy seems to encourage us to not only have what we need, but to have what we want. And it pushes us to want to have what we don't have. It pushes us to want what we don't have. And it even can push us to want what other people have. And so we live in a world that operates on an economy in many ways of covetousness. There's never enough. Just a little bit more. I mean, that's, that's what John D. Rockefeller said when someone said, well, how much do you need? I mean, this is still the richest man in, uh, you know, at least in U.S. history. And still, even if you adjust for inflation, he still is the wealthiest man. He's still, he's still wealthier than the, the richest individuals that we have today by comparison. And when asked how much is enough, he, he said a little bit more. That's, that's the heart. But here's the reality, friends. Money is not the problem. The love of money is the problem. Because Scripture presents that loving money is dangerous. Here's a few verses, 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. So just again, like it's not the root of all evil, but it is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Money can be dangerous. Loving money can be dangerous, rather. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So we must be aware of Scripture's warning. And there are many places we could go. Those are just a few. And wealth is a gift from God. We need to understand that wealth is a gift from God. Money is a gift from God to be used to provide for us. But it is difficult, and we need to acknowledge that. It is difficult to have wealth and not trust in that wealth. We have to be honest. It it is difficult. Our material possessions often focus us on things that we want, things that we think we want. I mean, I just know the material possessions I have can, can easily focus my gaze horizontally and on the things I don't have. And typically that happens the most when something breaks in my house. You know, something leaks, something, you know, breaks, and you got to fix it, and you're focusing on, I got to do that, and like, oh, well, if I just had this, I wouldn't have had to be doing this kind of thing, or if my house wasn't so old, and I start to think just about natural stuff, or the things that I don't have, or when the cupboard breaks, well, you know, if we just had a newer kitchen, and it goes on and on, and it doesn't matter how big your house is. Those temptations were the same when I had half a room in college as when maybe someone might have a 1,000 square foot home or 2,000 square foot home or a 5,000 square foot home. Doesn't matter how much you have. The wealth that we've been given does, can be a, a temptation to think about temporary stuff. Jesus said in Mark 4, 19, to the, in the parable of the sower, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things comes in and, and chokes the word. It, it can choke the word. We just have to be aware of that. Kent Hughes says, wealth can enslave so that 
one becomes possessed by possessions, comforts, and recreations. Now, it's a, it's a good test for us to ask the question, how do we respond? Now, this is, this is a good way to kind of test, do I love money? Well, I think I've been helped to, to answer that question in seasons of my life. Do I love money when uh, it's taken away from me? Or it's lost. Lost because I lost it. Lost because the economy changed and it no longer has value. Well, different things. So what, what happens in your heart? How do you respond? What comes out when your stuff is taken? Or when you have to give it when you don't want to? It's a good test. Again, it's not about how much you have. Because after being in Liberia, where they have very little, it was obvious they're dealing with the exact same struggles that we are. Because it's a heart issue, the desire for more, the desire to have a larger house or a larger church building or to have this thing or to have that thing. And it, it, it it can bubble up. And Martin Luther helpfully said, he said, there there are three conversions necessary. The conversion of the heart, obviously when we come to Christ, the conversion of the mind as we renew our minds as we are in Christ, and the conversion of the purse. We do it because it's it's a fruit. It, 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 It it exposes what's going on in our heart. The, The money and how we use it and how we handle it exposes what's going on in our heart. So what does it look like to be free from the love of money? If it doesn't mean that we give every little thing that we have away and never have money, though some of you who don't like to manage the budget and you'd prefer a barter society would think that that would be better, what what does it look like to be free from the love of money? Well, it looks like this, just a few things. When money is a tool and not an idol, when money is a tool and not an idol. Philippians 4 says, if any, if in any and every circumstance, Paul said, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So it didn't matter if he had a ton or if he had a little. It didn't matter if he had an overabundance or he was lacking. Money for him was a tool. It was something that he, he used because he, it didn't matter. He could do all things through Christ who strengthens him. When you believe, you have enough. So money is a tool. That that helps us to know when we're free from the love of money. But when you believe, you have enough. Ecclesiastes 5 says, whoever loves money never has enough money, or never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. 1 Timothy 6 to 8, but godliness and contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. When you have enough. So not like what you perceive is enough, but when in your heart you can say, yeah, we, we, have, we have enough that God's provided. That's when you're free from the love of money. Those who, who always crave more, will we'll turn away from God when their, when their Christianity brings material subtraction rather than material addition. If your foundation on, is that blessing looks like God gives me money, it's not a shaky foundation because that's not what, I mean, certainly God does provide, but if you're, if your idea of that's the, way, that's the only way that God provides when, when our faith means we are going to lose our possessions, just like the Hebrews were praised for the time when they joyfully accepted the plundering of their property. How does one joyfully accept the plundering of their property? Whenever I think of plunder, I think of pain, I think of hurt, I think of despondency, despair, depression, Despairing of life itself. But they joyfully accepted it. Why? Because their material possession weren't weren't the things that they loved. They had a greater hope in heaven. So when you believe you have enough, 
when your possessions point you to the provider more than the provision. So yes, we are given possessions. We are given blessings. The giver gives gifts. But those things are meant to point us to the provider. They're meant to point us to his great provision. They're meant to point us to worship. 2 Corinthians 6.10, at the end of that verse, it says, having nothing yet possessing everything. That makes no sense to the person who doesn't know Christ. What do you mean, having nothing but possessing everything? Did you have too much to drink at New Year's? Because that doesn't make any sense. No, having nothing but possessing everything. When you have Christ, you don't have to have stuff to satisfy you because you're satisfied in Christ. When you're satisfied in the provider, you're not dependent, your joy isn't dependent on what the provision is. So being content trusts the provider over the provision. So what, what steps can we take? to be free from the love of money? How can we free ourselves from the love of money if we're finding ourselves facing that temptation? And it's not, it's not really a question if we experience that temptation. We live in the wealthiest land ever to exist on the planet. We experience a measure of wealth, as we know, I'm not meaning to make anyone feel guilty. We, we just experience a measure of wealth that most in the world don't understand or don't even comprehend. So it is a temptation for us. So how do we fight against that? Well, actually, a little bit later on in the book of Hebrews, there's a great, a great helpful verse. But look at verse 16. Verse 16 says, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Two steps right there that we can, that can help us not hold on to the love of money. One's to do good. So it doesn't mean you don't have to... You don't actually have to use your money to, to be free from the love of money. You can use, you can serve. I remember in college, I'd hear about money and giving, and I'd go to my pastor and go, how do I do that? I, I don't have a job. And he's like, well, here's some ways, and he gave some practical things. So you can serve. It, it can mean you know, not getting paid for something. It can mean giving of your time. It can be serving on a ministry team. There's, there's many ways that you can have that heart of contentment and generosity without giving money, yet... Don't let serving be an excuse to be stingy with your money and possessions. I've seen that with some Christians. I give in other ways. Now, I am not minimizing the giving. I am not minimizing the widow's might where you don't have much, you're not giving much. I'm not minimizing that. Serving is the sacrifice of praise to the Lord. But some Christians can be like, yeah, no, I, you know, I'm... I, I give and I give generously in so many other ways. Oh, well, yeah. But I want to ask the question, is that because the Lord just said you need, that's how you want to give or you just don't want to give your money because that's, you hold that really close. So we, we need to, to be wary of that, but be generous. So how, do, how do we think about using being generous? So doing good, as it says, Right? Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. In Ephesians, it says, let the thief no longer steal. Let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he can fill his bank account and, and have a great 401k. No, that's not how the end of the verse goes. It, it goes so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Make money so you can give it away. So being generous like, how do I start being generous? Well, maybe start by investing in the ministry through your local church. Start by taking that step of faith, of, of tithing and trusting God. Start by, you know, maybe, maybe instead of when I'm going through the purge in my house, and I think, how much can I get for this? And I remember seeing that as a, as a kid, you know, you're eight years old, and you're like, oh, mom's doing a yard sale. I am going to make $100. I have this toy that I love so much. Mom, will you put this out? I'm going to get $100 for it. And I was like, oh, honey, maybe you get 50 cents. But sometimes we get so focused on, well, what can we get for that stuff that we're getting rid of? Rather than go, well, you know, maybe there's some places I'm just going to give it away. And I'm not saying that it's wrong to have a yard sale. Please do not hear me say that. But like we think about our hearts. 
or, or items on your Christmas list? Is any of the items on your Christmas list to give to Voices of Martyrs or to ARA or to Life Plan or sending Bibles to pastors in other parts of the world? I was blessed and encouraged uh, all the years that I've known my mother-in-law because every year I get a sweet gift from her. Every year she gives a certain amount of money, part of the Christmas money she set aside for our family. She gives to a ministry and she, she gives the letter of, of how it's being used. Not as an excuse not to buy a gift, but because she values giving and wanted us to value that. And it's become the, the one thing that I really anticipate getting other than the summer sausage that, that also comes. I do. I'm like, I, I wonder what she's going to give to this year. That's what I'm excited about. So there's many ways to be generous. And I think for Christians, Giving Tuesday should come before, before Thanksgiving, right? So not after Black Friday and, right, was a small business Saturday and Cyber Monday. And, and I'm sure somebody wanted Sunday. And so I'm sure there's going to be something else about that. And then, oh, Giving Tuesday, like after you've blown everything, oh, if you have a little extra left, just throw it. Oh, let's think how our hearts are engaged with money. Now, again, we've talked a lot about practicals. And taking these steps can free you from the love of money, and they can be helpful. But we must avoid the danger that actions alone are, are what helps us to be free from the love of money. Because contentment is a heart attitude. Money is not the problem. The love of money is the problem. We're called to be lovers of God. We're called to love others. We're called not to love money. So it's really our focus. It's not so much about not doing this. It's about being a lover of God and then a lover of others, being content and trusting the provider over the provision. Because the way of this passage isn't just on the first few verses of this, of verse five. It's really rooting contentment, not in this action of what you do to free yourself from the love of money, but what is it that your heart needs to be inclined towards and given to? Look at Verse five again, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Contentment comes from knowing the Lord's presence. Not that all those practical things aren't helpful to be used and that we wouldn't take steps, but contentment comes from someplace else. Being content trusts that the Lord is near. I will never leave you or forsake you. There was a story that I heard about from ancient times that tells of a king who suffered from a certain malady. I don't know what it was. And he was advised by his wise men that he would be cured if the shirt of a contented man were brought to him to wear. Okay? The search began for a contented man, but no, none, but none could be found. So emissaries were sent to the edges of the realm, and after a long search, a man was found who was truly content, but he had no shirt. The consensus of enduring wisdom is that contentment comes from a source other than things or possessions. It's not the, the point of that is not give away your shirt. The, the point is that contentment comes from a source that's other than our possessions. We can be content when the source of our contentment is not found in the false security that we get from owning stuff. No, contentment comes when we rest in the presence of God, which is with us always because he's the one who never leaves us or forsakes us. And if you are here this morning and you've never trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're like, I, I don't feel God's presence, well, the response to that is to come to him humbly and confess your sins 
and know that he sent his son Jesus to pay for your sins and you trust in him because when you trust in Christ, he sends his Holy Spirit who is called the helper, the helper, the Holy Spirit. Part of the Godhead comes and is with you all the time. No matter if you run from him, you can run to the back of this field, you can get on a plane and go to the farthest parts that you can go, you can put on scuba gear and dive as deep as you can in the ocean, and that Spirit of God is with you everywhere you go. Everywhere you go. And when you know that God is with you, it changes what you want. It changes what you need because he is with you. Being aware, we, we're called to pray at all times in the spirit and sometimes we don't really know what that looks like because we think prayer is only like when we put our knees on the ground and we pray by ourselves. But practicing his presence, and I don't necessarily like that phrase practicing his presence because I don't know why we're practicing like he is present. He's present. He was present when you, as, when you walked in the door, uh, he came with you. He's present. When you're sleeping, he's present. He's present. So let's consider other places in Scripture where, where we know it says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Here's, here's some verses to meditate on. Uh, Deuteronomy 31.6, when Moses encouraged the Israelites before he went into the promised land. It says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Or then Joshua after him, and Joshua 1.5, who was called to take over after Moses, he said, ah, God said, I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Then again, in 1 Chronicles 28.20, when David instructed Solomon to finish the temple, he said, do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord my God is with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Even after reading those, it's kind of like, how many times do we need to hear it? You know, I just need to hear it a lot. I need to hear it a lot. So if you need to hear it a lot, don't be discouraged. Be like, yeah, I've learned that before, but I just can't seem to, like, yeah, I get it. I, I, I need to hear it. I need to hear it again and again and again. And those are just helpful things to be reminded. The Lord is present. The reason we have anxieties about money and not ultimately, is not ultimately that we will not have enough. The reason we're anxious is because we don't see God. We don't see God. If we're out somewhere going for a walk and I'm with small children or I'm with my children when they're small and they, and they, they start to get hungry and they feel dehydrated, if they're off by their own, they're going to start to be like, oh, I need to... I need to find something. I need to think about what's going on. I don't, I don't feel great. But if I'm with them, oh, dad's here. He's got money. No big deal. We're going to be fine. When you see God, you're fine. That's why Jesus says, seek first the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom. You don't have to be anxious. We'll talk about that when we get to the Sermon on the Mount after the first of the year. Remember Jesus said this before he left. In Matthew 28, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Okay, so just just a reminder, there's no one in the universe that has more authority uh, because nobody else in the universe has any because Jesus ultimately has all of it. He has all of it. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he said, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. There's no secret unpacking of that word always in the original. It, it means always. It means every day, every moment, every waking moment, every sleeping moment, he is with you always to the end of the age. So our contentment comes from knowing his presence, being content, trusting the Lord is near. Well, the third observation is this. Contentment comes from knowing the Lord has promised to help. 
Because after he says, I will never leave you or forsake you, in verse 6, he says, so we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Being content means trusting the Lord's going to help. Not just that he's there, but like he's going to actually do something about it. He's our helper. We know from Psalm 50.10 that every beast of the forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills. Maybe you don't have a picture. Maybe you've ever seen cattle on a hill. But a thousand hills filled with cattle? He's got, he's got plenty. He's got more than enough. But oftentimes, it's not us believing that he has more than enough. Our contentment can often be because God hasn't given me enough of that more than enough. I mean, the way that he's provided for me is not enough. Clearly, he took a nap and didn't realize we have some greater need here that, that needs to happen. You know, being content trusts how the Lord chooses to help. So we can confidently say the Lord is our helper. I will not fear. But we have to trust in the way that he has helped. In the rare jewel of Christian contentment by by the Puritan Jeremiah Burroughs, he wrote this, you worship God more by contentment than when you come to hear a sermon or spend half an hour or an hour in prayer or when you come to receive a sacrament. These are only external acts of worship, but contentment is the soul's worship. To subject itself thus to God by being pleased with what God does. Contentment is being pleased with what God does, not just pining with what he hasn't done. Because he has done so much. That's why it's so helpful to be in fellowship with other believers, to be knitted together with other believers in a small group so you can be known and know, so you can be encouraging one another, so they can remind you, look what God has done. Because in in the struggles of life, we, we get these blinders and we just kind of look in front of us and we kind of think, ah, oh, like this hasn't happened. God must not be working. And when I'm in my small group, my, my brothers and sisters, they kind of peel the blinders back and go, no, look, look, God's working. When I'm ready to quit everything. No, don't, don't quit because God is working. Look, he already has provided. Just You need to see it. He has been your helper. It's not just he will be your helper in the future. Maybe if you do the right stuff. No, he has been your helper. Because he already met your greatest need by sending Jesus to the cross. And he sent his helper to be with you. And we can see evidence of that in every stage of your life. True contentment comes from resting in God's care. So inflation can rise. It can rise. I don't know about you, but when I read about it, um, contentment is not the fruit that immediately comes when you read about inflation. I don't know about you. You have to work to be reminded that God is sovereign. The economy could completely tank, and we can be content. We can lose all of our earthly rights. But we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Arthur Pink said, contentment is the product of a heart resting in God. It is the blessed assurance that God does all things well and is, even now, making all things work together for my ultimate good. Being content, trusting that the Lord will help and how he will help. So it is resting in his care. It is resting knowing that he is our helper. Because when you focus on God, you take your eyes off your stuff. So it doesn't matter how much or how little stuff you have. You have God. When we get to heaven, we're not going to take any of this stuff with us. But we are going to love heaven. I guarantee you're going to love heaven. You're going to love heaven so much more than anything that you've experienced in this world. Why are you going to love it? Because you get God. 
You get to be in the unhindered presence of the risen Christ who's so amazing that we don't need electricity or lights because his glory lights up everything. And because of what Jesus has done, we get God now. We can come boldly to his the throne of grace and find mercy and grace to help in time of need. So contentment comes from knowing what the Lord's promise comes from knowing that he's here. Now in closing, I just want to share a story that, that I learned of recently of the amazing lengths that people will go for money or to find contentment for money or with money or with treasure. In 2010, an eccentric millionaire by the name of Forrest Fenn launched a treasure hunt when he announced that he had hidden a chest that had an estimated worth of $1 million in treasure. Not just cash, $1 million in treasure. And he hid it in the Rocky Mountains. Tens of thousands of people set out to search for the treasure some of them obsessively. Because Fenn published in his, memoir, in his memoir, The Thrill of the Chase, he published to get families into the great outdoors, he, he put a little incentive inside the book with a, a 24-line poem that he claimed contained the clues to finding this treasure, which was a 10 by 10 chest of gold that he'd hidden somewhere in the Rocky Mountains. One woman searched for the treasure about 300 times. Another spent $75,000 and had an encounter with a mountain lion in her search for the treasure. Five men on different expeditions, five different men died in search of the treasure. And then on June 4th, 2020, Forrest Fenn made a stunning announcement that after 10 years, the treasure had been found. A medical student who had gotten obsessed with the chase had found it, and then he died. Forrest Fenn died two months later at 90 years old. Now, at face value, you could say, well, the driving force for some of these people was a sense of adventure. But there's a reality. There's a lack of contentment. Because many were going because that this they were going to cash in, do a little work, and I can cash in, and my problems will be solved. Or some, there was a lack of contentment because I can't have somebody else find that treasure. Because if somebody else finds that treasure, then I'm, I'm not even content that they won, and I've lost, and I'm defined by something that I do. I need to go do it. Even the guy who found the treasure wasn't content when he found the treasure because when he found the treasure, immediately he was paranoid that someone's going to jump out of the bushes and take it from him. He's in the middle of nowhere in the Rocky Mountains and he starts to become paranoid because he's not content. He's found a million dollar chest full of treasure and he has it in his hands and he's not content. Many made great sacrifices to find Forrest Fenn's hidden treasure. Some gave their lives. But here's the reality. Jesus actually tells us to be driven in the same way that those people were driven. He actually tells us to have the same, same energy. But he tells us to go for a different treasure. Because in Matthew 13, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he had and he buys a field. Contentment isn't passive, friends. It's actively pursuing Christ in his kingdom because Jesus goes on and says again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. The heart of these isn't, well, you just need to figure out how to be content, give a little way. No, the heart of the text is uh, 12 chapters 
that talk about how amazing Christ is. So let us pursue Christ. Let us let our aim be to seek and to savor Christ. Friends, if we do that, contentment is going to come. You're, you're going to be free from the love of money. In the song, Be Thou My Vision, it says, Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only, first in my heart, high king of heaven, my treasure thou art. Being content, trust the provider over the provision. Being content, trust that the Lord is near. Being content, trust the Lord will help and trust how he helps. But ultimately, contentment is rooted in being satisfied in the only one that can satisfy you, and his name is Jesus, and he's greater than everything. So let's pray. Father, the temptation right now is to feel guilt and shame because of maybe how we have viewed our money or used our money. Or the temptation would be we need to go do something right now. But the thing that we need to do most, Lord, is we need to sit at the feet of Jesus and be amazed at how great he is and knowing that he is with us, that he will never leave us or forsake us. You've confirmed that for us at the cross and with the resurrection and his reminder that he is always near. You are always near. So I pray, Father, we be aware of that right now. We ask this in Jesus' name.